Do you guys still get uh, scared when you get in front of the congregation? Um, I was just, I was thinking back there during worship, like, God, I'm afraid to go up there. You know, it's not the fear I felt when I first started teaching, when you're like, oh, I'm wondering if these people will listen to me and if they'll like me. That's a sinful fear. Because you're more concerned about what people think. And, and we've all gone through that. That's why people have a fear of public speaking. It's just, what if, what if they hate me? What if they reject me? But then you get comfortable up there and then you start going up there with confidence and, and, and you almost go through a phase where you like being on the stage and you like the spotlight and you just want those lights to be brighter and the crowds to be bigger. And, and it's hard because we grew up in a generation that taught us, I must increase so that he can increase. And so you start justifying, well, I've got to expand my reach. It's okay to grow in my fame because this way I can bring God along with me. I must increase so that he can increase. How else is he going to do it? It's not the scriptures. We must, we must, in this generation now, we have a chance and one last push, a lot of us. Some of us, uh, <laughs> you might not have even made it this morning from last night. But uh, I was thinking, I seriously went through my mind, I go, the odds of everyone making it through the night at their age. Um, <laughs> but I'm going, there's a... We have a shot still. You know, when I read the scriptures and I see what some of these people do when they see, oh shoot, that's what the law says, like King Josiah. We're gonna change everything. When, when Ezra, you know, like, you mentioned, like Gary mentioned last night, just read from the book of the law from daybreak until noon and the people are just standing Reading from the law. That's the part we skip. Like there's a chance for us to say, no, we've got to figure it out. How do we make him increase? How does this become sacred and not me? And there's little things we've done in our church, in our gatherings where communion is at the center. And if I teach, I'll teach from the side. And I know that's disruptive because it might mess up the video because the spotlight's right there. And maybe that's exactly what God wants. That somehow the body and blood of Jesus, it was central. And some churches have always been centered. First 1,500 years of church history, communion was at the center. And a lot of churches have continued that tradition, but 500 years ago, a guy named Zwingli decided, I'm going to move communion over and put my pulpit in the middle. And then others started following suit. And... Now the body and blood of Christ that once united us is moved aside. And now you have pulpits and preachers, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. All of them preaching different things. And then we wonder why the church is so divided. But what if we taught people again what is sacred and what is common? You know? And I'm not saying we don't teach, we teach. But what if we, what if our teaching time decreases? 
and the reading time of his word increases. You guys, last night when I read through Second Peter, see, I can see it from here, this perspective. I'm like, the room changed. It, it, there was a light and excitement in you that I can't muster up. It was like internal, it was manifesting externally. There was just a joy in this room over the word of God. Now, when I read 2 Peter last night, did any of you disagree with Peter's words? Anyone have a problem with anything he said? <laughs> Even chapter 3, there was nothing. You see how unity could be possible? If we would spend more time reading the Word of God and teaching our people to revere it and to love it, to love it more than our stories, our insights, where they just go, I want to hear from him. And there's something about the public reading of scripture that is powerful. That, yeah, that does what no one else can do. Because those words are living. I'm, I want to beg you again, read his word more. Uh, People are asking, how do you read the Bible in two weeks? I go, I had friends that read the Bible in three days out loud. They just took turns. And they said, let's just read through it cover to cover out loud. It took them 70 hours to go from Genesis to Revelation. Some of them took naps and this and that. But someone was always reading and they just wanted to be in the room and read the word of God. And they said, I, I can't even explain what happened when we got to the end of Revelation and the room just went nuts about the return of Christ. 70 hours out loud. So that means you can read it silently in probably 40 hours. Because it takes about twice as long to read it out loud. So we're not talking about impossible things. We're talking about 40 hours, you could do it in a week. You know those screen time notifications? That's all I'm going to say. You know, in our church, I'll often have, like my son-in-law usually leads us in communion, just so I can just sit there in the presence of God and commune with him. You know, I, let me just read from, um, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, um, verse 16, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. The word participation, I personally don't think it's a great translation. It's the word koinonia. Participation feels very, you know, like, did you participate in this? Yeah, we, we participate. The word koinonia, fellowship, and if you look up that word, one of the first definitions is intercourse. It's talking about an intimacy. And he says, this cup that we bless, is it not a koinonia, this intimate act with the blood of Christ? 
Now again, I'm not going to try to define that, and I believe that's where we, we get so diviner in so many things. It's a mystery. It's just a mystery. I mean, why did they have it at the center for all those years? It, someone challenged me a few years ago. They said, you know, how good is your church history? I know it's, it's, it's all right. You know, I took church history class, several of them. And they go, yeah, but your church history is probably from the last 500 years. He says, you ever study the first 300 years? What do they do? What do they do for 300 years? Did they read the Bible? Did they have the Bible? Parts of it. But what do they do for those 300 years? Because it was centered around the body and blood of Christ. It was centered around this participation, this mystery, this koinonia. So you go and you gather. I had a friend from India one time who drove me to an event and he's like, Wow, I mean, there were lights, there were uh, just crazy, you know, there were animals, horses, donkeys, everything. And he was like, wow. He goes, you Americans are funny. <laughs> he says, no one will show up if that speaker isn't going to be there. Or some great band or something. He goes, in India... When we hear that there's going to be communion, we get excited. And I said, wow, I don't think I've ever seen that. It's become common. It cuts into our time, our sermon time. I don't want to cut into my sermon time, so I'm not going to read chapters of the Bible. I don't want to cut into my sermon time by passing a plate or doing it however we do it, it just takes a lot of time. And yet, if I told you, hey, this morning you can listen to me, I've got a good sermon that I've prepared, or uh, there's actually another room back there, and Jesus is actually there in such a way that you can touch him. Like you could literally touch Jesus in there. Like, just, just touch his hand and then walk out. It's your choice. How many would stay in this room? And go, I don't know. I came to see Francis Chan. <laughs> Man, I sure hope this place would clear out. And go, I've got some shot at... Like, I'll drive wherever I need to drive. I'll fly wherever I need to fly. If... I could somehow commune with him, like touch him and yeah. coin a knee with his body and blood. Yes. See, and how often did I stand up here going, hey, you know, look at me. I've thought some things through. I've got notes and I've been working on all week. And it's like, oh, shoot, we ran out of time. We'll do communion next week. I'll let you touch him next week. Because you came for me, right? Came to hear another talk. We can change this, you guys. This is what I read in this book. There are people who step up and go, this was wrong. We blew it. We blew it. And it can change. And there's a younger generation that actually wants it to change. And if, if we who've been around for a while would be humble and go, you know what? I think I messed up. And in fact, I'm sure I have. Here's some ways that I've messed it up. And we need you guys to bring it back, you know, because you're that next generation. And they're done with the celebrity culture. They're done with all the gimmicks. They want like what we just sang about. My God, are you telling me I could go and actually experience your glory? Are you telling me like, like, like this could be like a Matthew 17 moment on that Mount of Transfiguration where the cloud would speak 
I mean, can you imagine if you were standing on, if you had a choice, again, between listening to my sermon or going up onto a mountain and having a cloud envelop it and then hear the very words of God coming from that cloud, what would you pick? So how much do we believe that these are the words of God? You know, that we treat it like we just heard from the cloud. And so in our gatherings, I love our gatherings because the pressure's off me now. And when my son-in-law or whoever is leading us in communion, I'm just like, so focused on him. God, I want a fellowship with you. I want to koinonia with you, with your body, your blood, whatever that looks like. I want as much of that as I can. This is why I came, is could my flesh and blood somehow koinonia with the body and blood of Christ? Mysteriously, God. I, I don't understand it but I want this. And then often I'll have my wife come up and just read a couple chapters of the Bible or anyone and, and I just sit and I just soak it in. And, and everyone else does too. It's like, and so by the time I speak, it's like, or if I speak before the reading of scripture, it's, 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 It's starting to take its rightful place. And the word of God and the body and blood of Christ are starting to take its rightful place again. And I'm seeing more of the younger generation go, yeah, that's what we want. We want the sacred. We don't need the hype anymore. We don't need you to be cool. We need you to be holy. We we don't want you to fit in. We actually want this to be something that's set apart. Okay, so let's, let's not try to draw people by the fact like, hey, we're just like the world. Let's draw them by, okay, I want to walk into something that is sacred, that is different that I can't get anywhere else. I can get good music on my phone. But to fellowship with the body and blood of Christ, to hear from God, and have a chance of experiencing his glory? Okay, that's why I want to go and gather. That's why these believers go, what? They're going to have communion? I'm there. Because there's something that happens when we as the body come together. And that's what I'm praying for. Even, you know, in Ephesians, In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, For this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. He says, I'm on my knees because I want something mysterious, like a power to strengthen you in your inner being. I'm not trying to rile you up with a talk, you know, and convince you to walk to an altar or whatever else. Not to say that's, I'm just saying, I want something deeper that is actually a power that is inside of you. That... That, that where, where, where you're, you're strengthened. And, and, and what I love about it, that passage is, it says, so that you together with all the saints, that there's something that we can receive here together. 
The Bible talks about this. You know, 1 John, he says, look, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, somehow his love manifests amongst us. See, I used to love my time. I still love my time alone with God, where it's just me, him, the word of God. That's it. I love it. I love it. But lately, the last few years, I've loved even more being together with true brothers and sisters that also want this glory. Because something happens when the church assembles, when we gather together for the right reason, with one heart and one spirit. Now we all come in with our agendas. Well, I want this, I want this, I want this. I wish the church was more like, no, but we all just go, show me your glory, show me your glory. I come here because I want to see your glory. I want to commune with your body and blood. I want to hear from the word of God. That's all I want. And so I'm going to love my brothers and sisters. And we're going to come and together say, show me your glory. There's something about that. There's something about when we gather together and together with the saints that we're able to comprehend just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. It's when we get to know the love of Christ. Know the love of Christ. Not know about the love of Christ, but know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. I can't teach you. I can't just put it on a screen and go, look, God loves you, here's why. It's beyond knowledge. There's some mystery that happens. And we need to bring back mystery. I mean, that's what, 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 what the scripture says. I just want to be a, known as a servant of God and stewards of the mysteries of God. That's why he says we, we just want to be, we just want to steward the mystery well. That's our job. And look, there's, there's a mystery that I, there was a mystery that happened to me when I was a teenager. I heard the gospel and something happened in me and it's mysterious and it was real. The reason why I know it's real, because I'm standing here over 40 years later going, you know, I, I'm still standing, you know? And, and I love him even more, and I love his word even more. And, and now I'm, I'm like revering even. I even have a greater fear, like, God, I don't want to take away any of your glory. I don't want, if you're on your throne and all those angels are just surrounding your throne like Revelation 5, I don't want to turn the attention, go, wait a second, look at me. I want him to keep staring at you, God. And I want to encourage everyone else to keep staring at you. And those who aren't looking at him, I want you to look at him. We've got to figure out, how do we do this? How do we do it? The word of God says something happens when we're together. And I just want to say just a couple more things and I want to read scripture again. It has to be real to us. Every, like, you need to know the love of Christ. I'm not going to assume, I will assume that everyone in this room knows about the love of Christ. But I'm not going to assume that you know the love of Christ. Paul's writing to believers here, he's writing to believers, and he's on his knees praying for believers. He says, you know, in the beginning, he says, you know, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to the church. He's talking to the church in Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And then he explains, I'm on my knees praying for you that you may know the love of Christ which surpasses comprehension. 
that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That I will not assume in this room. That you know the love of Christ. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. In fact, I want to get on my knees and ask for that to happen. Because there's a mystery of knowing the love of Christ. Really knowing it to where you truly are crying out from your spirit, Abba, Father. And it's you and you commune with him. And it results in this joy inexpressible. Like a joy inexpressible, a, a peace that's beyond comprehension. It's un fathomable how joyful and peaceful we are because of the grace of God this is a mystery and we have a better shot at it when we are together with all the saints because for some of us it's not natural to believe that we are loved some of you like me I my mom died when I was born, giving birth to me, and then my dad gave me up for adoption because he didn't want me. So I was on the earth, no one cared about me. In fact, I, all I was was a burden. There's no one on the earth that actually wanted me. My aunt ends up taking me from my dad's, you know, he already had the person uh, picked out who was gonna take me, just some random lady. And she took me away from him and sent me off to Hong Kong to grow up with my grandmother until it was too hard for her and then she made my father take me back. But he didn't want me. By then he had a Another child, my older brother and sister, and they didn't want me. No one wants me on the earth. So there's nothing in me where, where I just naturally know that I'm loved. No, the natural is no one wants me. Everyone would rather I didn't exist. But God but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. It, it's, it's, it's one of those things where in the flesh, I, to know, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Man, hey, when, I'm, when I'm tied to a tree by my father and he's grabbing branches and just going after me and I'm just like, screaming, please stop. Well, it's all over. You know when you cry and you can't even make noise anymore. And then and the worst is he just leaves me in the yard tied to a tree and it's getting dark. And I don't know if I'm allowed to untie myself and get in the house. And then you're telling me that God loves me and desires me. And I'm supposed to know from the core of my being, this love, you can't talk me into that. A mystery has to take place together with the saints. And there's a verse in um, Matthew 5.5 5 that I never really noticed before. I'm sorry, Romans 5.5. 5. It says, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Wait, so it says that God's love, His love is somehow poured into my inner being by the Holy Spirit. See, there's a love that is beyond comprehension. It doesn't necessarily go through your ears into your cognitive reasoning and, and, you know, and then it makes this transfer into your heart. No, it's poured straight into your heart from the Holy Spirit. And I was meditating on that. Oh, God, is this true? You can just 
pour things into the center of my being? How does that work? Because I thought I had to understand it through my cognitive reasoning, and then something happens up there, and then it has to slowly work its way down. And I believe God revealed to me, he goes, well then, what did we do with all these special needs kids? They can never know me? Or do we have a God so powerful that he can pour the love of God through the Spirit into their hearts? And this is our only hope. I want to pray that all of you, I don't know your background. There's a lot of insecurity in ministry because we don't know the love of Christ. We can't just sit here, do nothing, and just know that holy, holy, holy God has so much affection towards me. We, we still get into this works mentality for those of us who could never quite earn our parents' love or approval. But their approval is not the same as love. You know? And we're chasing after something that God says, don't chase that. It is finished. I am loved. I am so loved. And I want to pour my... This is what separates us from Every, the rest of creation, we are able to receive the love of God. This is what he wants for us. He wants us to know his love. He created us in his image so that we can actually know and that he can actually abide in us. That the Father and Son would actually come and live with us and the Spirit would actually dwell in us. I was made in a mysterious way, in the image of God. Just as the Father and Son is one, just as the Father has loved the Son, so has the Son loved me, and He's inviting me into this union, this eternal union of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so I can actually receive His love and be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the mystery I'm after. And we want to lure people in with raffles. <laughs> you guys, this is a mystery. This is an awesome mystery. And I believe this morning I can come before the throne of grace and ask God to just pour his love by his spirit into your hearts to where that mystery that took place in my heart at 15 it lasted, it lasted. and I believe that for some of us who believe and we are believers like the Ephesians were believers that he can do something mysterious in our inner being to where we're rooted and grounded in love. Not performance, not fear. We're rooted and grounded in love. And he'll give us strength to comprehend together with all the saints that somehow this mysterious gathering will produce in us the ability to comprehend, to know the love of Christ, to know how wide and long and high and deep and to truly know God is crazy about me right now. Amen. I'm telling you guys, some of you will understand what I'm about to say. For years as a pastor, I could stand in front of a crowd and with confidence go, I love Jesus Christ. But I could not with the same confidence say, Jesus loves Francis Chan. 
There was something that, that felt arrogant about that. See, that's, that's what Satan does. He goes, oh, that's pride. It's like, no, that's gospel. That's gospel. You know, like there's something about, I can't say. You, you know, like, like John, admit it. When you read John and he calls himself the beloved disciple, doesn't it bother you? And if you were one of the other disciples and he kept calling, I'm the one he loves. Right? It seems arrogant. It seems arrogant to say, I am the one that he loves. And, and for years, I, I thought, I want to be Elijah on Mount Carmel. Man, bring it on. Bring on any faith. And I want to call down fire from heaven. Or I want to part the Red Sea. Or, or, or when, when, Elijah, when, he, when, when he just calls down fire whenever he wants. Burns up 50 people. 50 more come. Watch this. Boom. There, I want to do that. I want to do that. I look at all these things I want to do. It's only been in the last year or two where I've thought to myself, God, if I could do anything that I read about in this book, It's when John lays his head on the chest of the creator and judge. And then he defines himself as, I'm the beloved. I'm the one that leaned my head against his chest. Can you imagine how secure you are at the moment? You have holy, holy, holy God who's far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion above every name that is named and will be named. And now your head is on his chest. And you know he's okay with it. And he loves it. He's the beloved disciple. All my life, I've looked at other people in this book. Oh, I wish I was like that. Oh, I want him. I want this. And now I'm going, God, I just want to know that I'm that loved. I just want to be that disciple that can lean my head on your chest. And I, I never noticed that the word beloved is just the words be loved. Yeah. I was like, oh. I should have known that. But I have a hard time just sitting and being loved. I just feel like I got to earn something. I got to do something. Rather than just take a piece of bread, drink of a cup, and just be loved by him. Just to hear his precious words that he speaks to us and go, wow, I just want to be loved by him. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that if any of them are just struggling with being loved, change us, Lord. Make us like John, Lord. Help us to just be loved, be known for being loved. Help us that if we're going to boast in anything, that we boast in being known and loved by you not because of anything we've done or will do. It's blasphemous. It's because of your grace. It's because you are love and you so loved that you reconciled us. God, bring joy back into our hearts, not because our church is growing, not because we have more followers, but because we have the confidence to lean our head upon your chest 
and just commune with you. May our joy be from fellowship in koinonia with your body and blood and going, who are we to koinonia with your flesh and blood? To hear your words, to see your glory and not be consumed. God, may this be the joy of our lives. Please, Lord, fill us. And God, give us ears to hear right now. Help us see ourselves on that mountaintop as we listen to your word. I pray for supernatural attention span right now. For those of us who have been addicted to our phones, give us reverence to set your word apart as we listen to your word out of Ephesians 2 and 3. Just listen to this. I'm just going to listen to this and enjoy these words of love from God, my Abba Father. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your living and active word. Thank you that you've promised that it will not return void. Thank you that heaven and earth will pass away, but not your word, because you have exalted it above all things your name and your word. Please, Lord, now, give us wisdom from heaven on how to exalt your word before our people. Show us the good works that you've created us to do. 
Teach us how to decrease so that you can increase. Please fix this mess that we've made of your church. The self-exaltation, the selfish ambition, the competition, the division. We humble ourselves. We seek your face. We want to turn from our wicked ways. We receive your forgiveness. Now heal your church and distinguish yourself from all these other belief systems because you alone are God. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We rest in this promise. Thank you for building your church. Thank you that the gates of hell has not stood against it. And thank you that 2,000 years later, we have enjoyed your promise. Thank you for your church. Thank you for this body. Thank you that we can stand together and become a dwelling place for your spirit. Come and dwell amongst us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.